Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you this morning for bringing us together once again to worship. We give you thanks for your sustenance all through the week. And we thank you because you have been kind and gracious to us. Thank you for rain. Thank you for a good weather. Thank you for bringing us from our various homes to our place of worship this morning. Now, Lord, we ask that as we approach the worship of your holy name, you would grant us forgiveness for our many sins. Indeed, Lord, if there is something that will come in between us and communion and fellowship, these are sins. So we come at the start of our worship asking that you forgive us. Look upon us, O God, with pity and forgive us for the sake of your Son. And we pray that as we consider our doctrinal class, our studies through our confession, that you grant us understanding. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our eyes, and cause that we would understand the things that will be considered this morning. Pray for our brothers and sisters who are yet on their way, perhaps um, due to the weather, being restricted from being here early. We pray that you bring them here and cause that we would know of your presence as a local church. We've asked all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please turn to page 40, 44, or really 43, of the confession. And this morning, I'll be doing an introduction, a very, very quick introduction to paragraph 7. So if you noticed, um, um, we're not just doing a, let's look at the words and move on. I'm trying to get it like very, I'm trying to get it home, trying to look at our local, local church and trying to ask how will these things look like, how will it affect our day to day, right? And it's a question we need to really ask when we study the confession. One of the reasons people think the confession is not practical is because they don't think and ask how does it, how, it should, how should it affect me? If you're looking at this as a mere academic document, you'll be amazed. It's very detailed. But if you're looking at it from um, the perspective of a believer who wants to learn how to pattern his or her life, and it's a local church who wants to pattern her life in a way that is pleasing to God, it will make much more sense. So over three Sundays, we looked at paragraph six. Just want to remind us, we said three things about church membership. That church membership is evangelical, church membership is volitional, and third, church membership is... God bless you, sir. Covenantal. And under that covenantal, under the idea of covenantal church membership, we looked at two things. Who can remember? No. Over two Sundays, we looked at two major things. The first... What was the first? Pri privileges of church members. And then the second? Obligations of church members. So, and so that is not in the confession. I was just trying to get it out and say, what would this look like for us? This morning, I would be introducing us to church polity. Polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y. It's a subject that is not talked about a lot but it is a very important subject. What is church polity? Let me give a definition, then I'll read our own perspective as we form Baptist in paragraph 7. Church polity refers to the structure of governance in the local church or a group of churches. It's very simple. Church polity, church government. We're looking at the structure of governance in a local church. That's church polity. And if you look at paragraph 7, you will see the Reformed Baptist position on biblical church polity. When I say biblical, somebody will come from my head, but on church polity. Paragraph 7. It says, To each of these churches thus gathered, according to the Lord's mind, as declared in his word, he has given all the power and authority which is in any way required for them to carry on the order of or pattern of worship and discipline which he has instituted for them to observe. He has also given all 
the commands and rules for the due and right exercise of this power. The question of church polity is where does authority lie in the local church? Where does authority lie? Where, where is the power in the local church? Where is the authority in the local church? And if you look at paragraph 7, what does it tell us? Look at, we just read it now. Where does the authority lie? Look at it again. To each of these churches, remove the parentheses, he has given all the power from Baptist. Uh, what do we believe? I want to look at it more holistically. And it's also for our own, for our own understanding of how things work. When we go to a different church, can we make sense of the polity there? And guess what? It helps us to, let me not run ahead of myself, it helps us to understand why we do what we do and why we are different from other churches. I was listening to a pastor this week on this subject and he said, there are generally two types of people in his church. There are those who are coming from, you know those kinds of churches where Members vote on every single thing. Every single decision making. Remember, I've already said congressionalism does not mean members vote on should we change the tile, should we paint the church? That's not for members to vote on. At least we don't find that happening in the New Testament. We have patterns set for us. And then you have other people who don't care. You just come to the church like ah, that's why you are the pastor of the church. And you are asking us, you want to paint, paint. You want color, choose color. Why are you? Again, I know there are people like that in this church. Sometimes you are just frustrated. You come and everybody just talk it up. What is the point of all this stuff? Just say we do this and move on. So understanding church polity will help us to know where we are coming from and where we ought to be. Now, but some people will think this is not very interesting. And truth be told, church polity, just discussing about how the church should be governed, may seem like an unnecessary distraction. Maybe that person is not here, but somebody may be saying, shouldn't we be learning more about Christ? Abby, you want us to sit down and start talking about constitution, authority, Episcopalianism, the elders, the deacons, the members of the church. And there's some merit here. Because we should desire to know more of Christ. So imagine you come to church and all you hear is church polity, church polity, church polity, church polity. That's not a very, very healthy diet. But for some of us, it's easy, it's easy to, to zone out, just remove our minds from what is being said. At the end of the day, the church will, why does it, why, why does it matter if I understand all of these things? But some people also have looked at church polity as a cause of disunity. Because the truth is, we will be very wary of associating with certain kinds of churches with certain kinds of polity. We'll be wary. And there's a reason for that. We'll be wary because we'll get there. But sometimes we are wary. And it looks as if we're not, we're not being united. Maybe the guy preaches the gospel, but the guy is a pope. We can't associate with a pope. Really? We can't associate with a pope, a man who has no accountability. He started the church for ground up and now he's a general overseer, senior general overseer, national over, worldwide general overseer. And then he said, okay, let's associate with him. He said, okay, hold on. What is the structure within his church for his own spiritual health? You know, that is what will help us from, how do they say it? Biting our fingers. You go and shake somebody's hand. Tomorrow you hear something else. I see that the guy has no accountability. There's nothing in place, no structure. And then you are like, ah, why did I do this? And there's some merit here. But let me say something about the disunity thing. This is one of those areas where we must be gracious to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not all of us will fall on the same page on the matter of church governance. Not all of us will follow the same page. As long as you can ascertain that this person is a believer, this church is a Christian church, with the preaching of the gospel, with the administration of the sacraments, with church discipline in place, if they differ from us, we should be gracious to them. 
So it's not as if anybody, because some Baptists can be, whew, they love their liberty. They can fight over the fact that they must vote on the budget. If we don't, and then, so you go to a place and hear that, ah, we don't vote on the budget too. Or we are not involved in the admission of members. By the way, all of the things I've been trying to explain about membership, and it's really from a congregationalist, a congregational point of view. And so we must be gracious to people who land on a different page from us. Our Presbyterian brothers, uh, perhaps some of our Pentecostal brothers, some maybe Methodists or Anglicans, we should be gracious because we will not all land on the same page. So it shouldn't be a cause of disunity. And it shouldn't be something we throw away because we want to know more of Christ. So let me put it positively. Why should we strive to understand this matter of church polity? Number one, the Bible is not silent on church polity. The Bible is not silent on how the church should be governed. Perhaps you've not sat down to thought about to think about it. Now, if you're looking for a chapter of the Bible, this is where the problem lies. You may be looking for a chapter of the Bible where the topic is church polity. There's one. And when the church gathers at an ordinary general business, at the ordinary general meeting, the secretary shall take the minutes of the meeting, and this person will do this. And because you don't see it there, you think there's nothing in the Bible about church polity. There's nothing in the Bible about how the church should be governed. But the Bible is not silent. For example, we know that the churches, I mean, looking at the New Testament, they held meetings. Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to forsake the assembly, the gathering of believers. So they had meetings. Of course, church services, but other kinds of meetings as well. The Bible tells us, at least in Acts chapter 1, you know, you know that was an election. You know that was an election. Look at it. Acts chapter 1 verse 23. Acts 1.23. You know what? Let me not start from 23. Let me start from 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And Peter spoke on and on and on and on and on until we get to verse 23. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the Lord fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is some kind of election. This is a kind of selection process. This is church polity. Who chose Matthias? Eh? Who chose Matthias? Ma? Eh. But look at it now. I said in those days. 15, look at verse 15 again. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. When they say brothers, not men. The brothers and sisters, the brothers, people in Christ. And the company of persons was in all about 120. And they voted as 120. Okay, church. Same thing happened in Acts chapter 6 when they had issues. So the Bible is not silent. And they said, the apostles said, we cannot leave the ministry of the word and prayer and serve tables. So go find men full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith and bring them to us. They presented them to the apostles and they were ordained. We may call them deacons, we may not call them deacons. Churches had officers, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, in his introduction, is greeting the elders and deacons of the church at Philippi. Churches practice discipline. First Corinthians 5, you know that case of the man sleeping with his father's wife. Churches gave and received letters of commendation. Remember the case of Apollos. Apollos, again, sometimes I think we all know these things. But turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 21, 27. Uh, so that when we say... Bring recommendation letter. Somebody will say, where, where, did you, where, where did you see recommendation letter from? 
And when Acts 18, 27, and when Apollos wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. By the way, this is the pattern. If you're leaving SDLC to another church, we send the letter with you. You take the letter to the new church and say, this is my, this is church policy. Because then you have to start discussing on how the letter is to be written at all. Churches administered the ordinances, 1 Corinthians 11. Churches baptized and received members. You see that in Acts 2.47. So you see that the Bible is not silent. And so when we look at all of these examples, this is just a few. This is, this, this is not all the evidence. We can come to a conclusion on how the church ought to be governed. The Bible is not silent. But let me put it more directly. When we govern the church as the Bible tells us to, well, Christ governs his church, but you, you get the point. From our own point of, of view, we glorify God. When we obey God and the way he has asked us to live and structure his church, we glorify him. So it's not a matter you, that doesn't matter. So I don't, I don't even get the point. It's not something that doesn't matter because the glory of God is at stake. So if we say we don't care how the church is ordered or how the church is structured and we just do our own thing, we don't glorify God. In fact, we may be sinning. When we say we don't care, we just want to come and go. Whatever you want to do, do. Number two reason, why should we study church polity? A sound structure is essential for the health of the church. A sound and biblical structure of governance in the church is essential for the health of the church. Now, many issues persist in the church because people don't understand how the church ought to be governed. People don't understand what the right way is. Let me give an example. I have seen where people are angry at pastors who are simply just doing their jobs. They are just doing their jobs. They look at the Bible, they say, this is what the Bible says we should do, let's do it. All of a sudden, somebody picks offense and says, ah, why are you doing this this way? Why are you doing that this way? People are angry at other members for simply being members of the church because they don't understand how the church ought to be structured. That when we come together as members and officers, there are responsibilities. We'll get to that in paragraph 8 and 9. There are responsibilities. So if, if we don't do our part as members, if the pastors don't do their part, if the deacons don't do their part, fights may happen in the church, gossip may arise. Let me give you even a popular example, the issue of church discipline. If we don't understand how the church ought to be governed even in that matter, guess what will happen? Members will be fighting members because of a disciplinary issue. You see, it's essential that we understand this. All of a sudden, you come to a church, you have three camps. You have three camps. This one said, my friend was treated unjustly. This one says, in fact, the punishment was not enough. We should have gone far and beyond. And this one says, whatever this person wants to say. And then we are divided amongst ourselves. Because we don't understand that when the church comes together and the church speaks with one voice, and this is church polity, by the way. When the church comes together on any matter and the church speaks, everybody submits to the church. We looked at that last week. Everybody submits to the church. Whether I like it or not, I submit to the church. It was Pastor Corrad in Bewe. I heard this from a second, somebody he told, when he was going to Gabata Baptist Church. The vote was cast. He didn't get uh, all the votes. It was a pretty big church. I think he just clipped through. You know those kind of voting, you just, you just cross the, if it's 70%, you just crossed it and you entered. Now, don't you think it would be madness for some members to now come and say, he's not my pastor? That's what misunderstanding of church politics causes. You say, then all of a sudden you start hearing the conversation. Me, I no vote for him. I don't know. I told you people that this guy is not spiritual. People went to vote for him. And then when an issue arises in the church, you just see people grouping together. You see what I was saying that this guy is not sound. He's not sound. I said he was not sound. Why are we surprised? I said because majority carries the vote. If Mumuna majority, we are all gone. And so you, you see, you see, the church is no longer healthy because we don't understand how the church ought to be ordered. Might I even suggest 
that the unity of the church is somewhat dependent on a sound biblical polity. It's essential. I have been in a church where... <laughs> so this is a, 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 a big, big church where in Kaduna... So in Kaduna, Kaduna was a region. And under Kaduna, but the, the church has grown bigger. Now you have Castina, Kano, Northwest, two region. The region of Asia messed up. And then the MD say, he won't go reporter. This church political, by the way. And so the, the guy had messed up, wanted to go and report him. Then he traveled to Lagos to headquarters. Everything is here. And when he got to the queue, the people in that place called in Oga say, your boy, Dale. Your boy, Dale, won't come see you. you know, they didn't even t- I, don't, I don't think they knew the detail. They say, your boy, Dale. The guy in Kaduna now told his friend in Lagos, no allow and see, no allow and see Gio. Don't allow him to see the Gio. And so he was frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. Eventually came back to Kaduna. So you, you see the kind of thing that happens. So that guy, perpetually, if you meet him, you say, this guy, this general Vasya is a joker church polity. A healthy church polity helps the church to be united. Which is why eventually I will argue that congregational church polity is the best of all. Number three, we can be better and more responsible members. I mean, I've said this already. Why we must understand this so that we can be better and more responsible members. We've said this already, that the universal church finds its expression in the local church. Now, when we gather in the local church, we ought to know how the local church should function. We ought to know that. And understanding church polity will help us know that and give us confidence to carry out our duties. You should not be afraid. Sometimes you see people, we we shouldn't be afraid. I mean, in our own church now, before I explain fully how we should look like, because not today, but the church member should not be afraid to ask uh, sorry, you. How do we come to this decision? Shouldn't be afraid. You are a go- you are a governor in the local church. So that's my introduction. I will just enter a bit of into a bit of um, the different views of how the church ought to be governed. And what I want to look at is a few versions a few models of church governance. And as we look at each of these models, we want to look at the distinguishing features of these models, what parts of scripture that was used to establish this model, what are the pros and what are the cons. So that we look at everything and we're able to understand, oh, this is why this church behaves this way, and this is why we don't behave this way. So there are five models or five forms. I'm not sure I'll look at all of them. Maybe I'll look at just one today, but next week we'll conclude um, the the, the remainder of them. So first of all, Episcopal. Episcopal church governance or Episcopal uh, polity. You find this among the Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, and the Methodists. Methodists sometimes can be confusing. Again, these are broad categorizations. So in some churches you find that it's not really as we think it is. And number two, how many of you have heard of Erastianism? Erastianism. E-R-A-S-T-I-A-N. Is the idea of basically it. Um, so when we talk about the relationship between church and state, the Erastian will say that the state is above the church. So that's why we have we used to have back then, especially in Europe, national churches. So that the king of England or the queen of England is the head of the English church. Does it make sense? So so that idea of a a national church where the magistrate is over the church, the church, that's also another form. The third will be Presbyterian, which we, we all know. The fourth will be Congregational, and under this model, you have Baptists. We are, we are really Baptists in polity. We have Congregationalists. So, 
Baptists are not congregationalists. How many of us understand that? You can just nod. Baptists are not congregationalists. There are two different types of people, but they both share congregational polity. Okay, let me explain. The Baptists were emphasized to two major areas where they would differ from the Presbyterians. The Baptists would say, we will not baptize our babies, we will baptize only believers, and we will not have your system of church government. Those are the two areas where the Baptists differ from the Presbyterians. The Congregationalists differ from the Presbyterian on just the subject of church polity. So Congregationalists will baptize their babies. So think of, I'll just mention one popular name. John Owen was a Congregationalist. They were the ones who wrote the Savoy Declaration. Congregationalist Savoy, 1689 Baptist. But both the Congregationalists and the Baptists share the same view of a Congregational Church government. Does that make sense? You can go back and listen to the recording. So Congregational Church government, would, 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 um, you would find it in both Baptist churches, you find it in congregational list churches. You'll find it in some Lutheran churches. And number five, you have some non-governmental, like the Quakers and the Brethren. Have you met anybody from the Brethren, Plymouth Brethren movement before? If not, I think there's a part of them in Kogi State. Is anybody from Kogi State here? You know, I was a pastor Butu, so he used to tell us stories. You can come to church, there's no government. Who has a word from the Lord? As we did here like this. So, Ronald will raise up his hand. I have, he will just bring him up. He comes and brings, yes, it's like that. So they, they, don't, they don't like any structure. They don't ordain anybody. They are no church officers. They are just governmentless. And the reason why I included it is because I think we are, some of our churches, I don't really understand what's happening in Nigeria. A church will just start up. Sometimes people call it a fellowship. I don't know if you've ever been to such, you enter the place, it's a small group of people, they, find, they have a day of meeting, and then you ask, what is the organizational structure here? We are all brothers in Christ. We just came to worship. And I'm very confused usually. Like, wh- what's this, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? People should belong to local churches. You can't just belong to a fellowship and say you are part of the church. So let me just look at Episcopalianism quickly. Now, the word Episcopal is from the Greek word Episcopos. The Greek word Episcopos is usually translated in our New Testament as bishop or overseer. Bishop or overseer. This system of church government is hierarchical. Now, church government will usually fall into two categories. Ah, I wish I had a board. The first category are those where you find a top-down approach to governing the church. In a congregational church setting, you have, what kind of setting do we have? It's like round table. There's nobody higher. In a congregational church government, you just have like this. Members of the church, even elders and deacons, they have one vote. If I'm voting on the matter, the elders have one vote, just as the members have one vote. The deacons have one vote, just as the members have one vote. It's not as if in the church meeting, the pastors of the church have two votes, or two and a half, or one and a half. It's the same. When the time comes to nominate, well, let me leave that one aside. So, that's congregational. But in, a, in an Episcopal system, you have a hierarchy. So, let me explain. At the bottom chain, you have the laity. People like, I'll just say you and me, but... I've forgotten that I'm no longer in, in the category. But you have the laity. These are just church members. They have little or no say. You can just come to church on Sunday and the pastor tells you, um, yeah, we are buying a church bus. We just bought a land somewhere. We are getting a loan of 50 million naira. And we're building a cathedral to celebrate our 50th year anniversary. You don't have anything to say. You just stand up and say, woo, 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 woo. You just clap your hands. And then you go home. You have nothing to say. That's an episcopal. So you start from the lady who have almost nothing to do. Above them, you have the, the pastors of the church or the elders of the church. Deacons are there also, but I don't want to put deacons, just the elders of the church. Above the elders of the church, you have bishops. 
Can you see the problem? So, they have differentiated between the bishop and the pastor. The pastor is here. The bishop is here. The archbishop may be above the bishop. And in the Roman Catholic Church, the biggest bishop is the pope. So, you can see it's hierarchical. So, even the pastor does not have so much of a say. He can decide certain things in his church, but the bishop is the one who will tell him, uh, okay, okay, so you people have widows, close down the widow's fund. Something like that can happen. So the, the, the bishop doesn't have to know, and the bishop will usually be in charge of a group of churches. So you have Lekki now. You have a bishop, maybe you have a church here, a church at um, Eleganza, a church at Adja, and then you have pastors in each of these local churches. All of these pastors report to the bishop. And then in some cases in a very big system, the bishops will report to the archbishop who will report to the pope. Something like that. That's how um, it, it looks like. Now, what parts of scriptures are used to establish this? Acts chapter 20 verse 28 Paul says the overseers are meant to shepherd the church. So they says, so they say, so again, it's episcopos, the Greek word episcopos, and they say, well, these are bishops in Acts 20, 28. In fact, 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. Hope you know Paul did not say if anyone aspires to the office of the elder. It's if anyone aspires to the office of the episcopos, the overseer, the bishop. And they argue from 1 Timothy 3 that the bishop and the elder are different. The overseer and the elders or pastors of the church are different. In fact, you know this one, Titus 1, 5 to 7. Paul tells Titus, appoint elders in Crete. And so they say, wait, hold on. Titus was a bishop who appoints elders. So in an episcopal system, the church members don't vote for their pastors. They don't do that. The bishops will assign pastors to the churches as they see fit. They will turn to Titus chapter 1 and say, after all, Paul told Titus, put things in order, ordain elders. And so Titus was ordaining elders because he was the bishop. What are the pros? Well, unified doctrine. It's one of the easiest ways to have unified doctrine in the church. So if everything is coming from the head to the bottom, the Pope will tell you the documents you use. He tells you the Anglican Church will give you the Book of Common Prayer. They give you the 39 articles. You don't need to reinvent anything. It just comes from the top. And then we can have uniformity. In fact, the bishops can ensure that everybody under their diocese are conformed to the standard of the church. So there's unity. It's not like when you come to Reformed churches or Baptist churches, this one will sing hymns, this one will use keyboard and guitar. That kind of thing doesn't really happen when you have an Episcopal system. Everything is detailed for you, to the order of service, to the liturgy, sometimes even to the sermons that are preached in the church calendar. Everything is unified. So if I'm doing 2 Samuel this morning, the person at Eleganza is doing 2 Samuel, the person at Aja is doing 2 Samuel. Another benefit, I say benefit pro, is that there's stable leadership. I mean, we would understand this. If... I run away tomorrow and say, I don't do it again. I won't die. The church has to come back to the scratch and say, let us find out. But in, a, in, in an epi- episcopal system, uh-uh, people day now. Bishop will just call, call, call. Who don't graduate? Who don't do this one? Oh, yeah, come to church. My next one, do you have a new pastor? As one is dying, if a pastor is dying or people are, there, there's, there's always stability in the church. The church members never have to say, ah, what is happening? There's always a priest. There's always a bishop, a pastor, elder. Another pro will be pastoral oversight. Because the pastors have people over them. So in their day-to-day, because the bishops are not really interested in the day-to-day. So let me give us an example, how I've seen it done in some churches. So this is Sunday morning. If we have a bishop, he, would want to, he may want to tra- uh, travel through the three churches this morning. So he will come here for doctrinal class. As we're finishing, he goes to Eleganza, stays there, observes their worship, observes what's going on. Then maybe he may do the full service there. Then in the evening, he will go to Aja. Then the next Sunday, he will then reverse it. He will do doctrinal class here. He's just going around the churches. That's the work of the bishop. So the pastors are not left alone. 
And of course, you can have a long-term vision that way. If you have that kind of a system, the vision comes from the Pope. It goes to the archbishops or whatever how that thing works. Then it goes to the bishop. So even if somebody moves, moves, the plan is the plan. What are the cons? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a division between bishops and elders. So again, the, we are gracious to them, the Episcopalians, but the Bible doesn't tell us that these are two offices. So let me show you a proof. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. That bishops are elders, are pastors, are shepherds, all in one. Look at from verse 1 to 3 to 4. So this is Peter speaking. He says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So who is he talking to? Huh? Elders. Verse 2, he says, shepherd the flock of God among you. In other words, pastor the flock. So the elder is the pastor. Then he goes on to say, exercising oversight. Be an overseer or be a bishop. Not under compulsion, but willingly as God will have you, not for shameful gain. Let's stop there. So, you see that Peter is talking to the same group of people. They are exercising oversight, overseeing the church. They are the bishops of the church. They are the pastors of the church. They are the elders of the church. The title bishop, I don't really understand how it happened. In the house I came to Kaduna one time. When my father told me the story, I was like, ah, actually, this man, yeah, he lived. Because the church started on the same street where he, he was living then. In the house I came, he said, ah, he said, oh, yeah, people once came to him to preach. I said, eh? Sometimes you think these people are big people. That they came to do evangelism one time then in Kaduna, where he started this church. And there has been a baptizing of somebody comes to ordain this person a bishop. The other person goes to ordain this person a bishop. The house became archbishop. Oedeko became bishop. Um, Duncan in Ghana became archbishop. You know Duncan? Became archbishop. And then they, they, there was something happening in West Africa, 70s, 80s. What were they were just, I don't understand what they were doing. Actually, it's the same thing. It's not a great title. I'm a bishop. It's not a big title. It's, it's just, if you're a pastor, you're a bishop. There's no, it's, we have turned it into something in Nigeria and the Episcopal system. A pastor is a bishop who is an elder, who is a shepherd. It's the same office. It's the same office. So the Episcopalians divide that thing. I don't know what they were doing, but they were clearly not looking at the Bible properly. And that con is that there's potential for corruption. Woo! So we initially said, um, the guys down are checked, but the higher you go, there are lesser checks. So who checks the bishop? Who checks the bishop? So you see corruption, you see... Archbishop, who checks the Archbishop? And there's somebody before, the, between that and the Pope. So how many people will the Pope check? You see why it's a very funny way of doing church? I mean, will he check? So corruption can fester. Immorality can stay in the church. Money can be embezzled regularly. You as a congregation, you can't ask any questions because your offering, the usage of your offering is not determined by you. Is determined by those are above you. Which is why some people began to say, oh, we don't want to pay tithes, we don't want to pay. Because the truth is, they don't decide their tithes. Now, uh, also ministry is usually concentrated in the laity, in the clergy, rather. But if, 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 and it's just, it, it, it's not rocket science. If decision making is taken away from the members of the church, ministry is really taken away from them. So you come to them and say, okay, we want to establish 10 ministries. Prison ministry here, prison ministry there. They'll be looking at you. You made the decision, implement it. Sometimes people will really flow and go and serve. People would even usually serve. But they are not really part of the ministry of the church. It, you see, this, is not, this model doesn't align with Ephesians 4, 11 to 15, where the members are equipped for ministry. 
which is something that is going to be very emphasized in Baptist churches. It's not really there. So examples of churches I've said it, but it looks different from church to church. The Anglicans have this type, same type of system. You know, in the Anglican church, they actually have, in the local church, they have different ordained people. Some of them are actually voted by the local church. As I say, some differences will exist. The, I'd forgotten the names of these people. Who, who is an Anglican? Yes, you have leaders that are voted. Um, there's, there's another name they call them. Who do the practical, some of the practical things of, of the church? Something like that. But when it comes to the overseeing of the church, which is where we are focusing on, um, it is bishops who choose and move them around. Um, if, if you are angry at them, remember J.C. Rao that you liked it was a bishop, so you like bishops. The Roman Catholic Church, of course you know that one. Methodist churches. Now let me say this. Many of our Nigerian churches are actually Episcopalian. I sat down and I thought about it. I said, where do I classify living faith church? It's Episcopalian. So the bishop in Bishop Oyelipo tells them, this is what you preach on this Sunday. Emmanuel and Irene, in my own understanding, I think the guy is Episcopalian. Now, again, it's possible to do these things without thinking. The pattern is set. You just, well, the pattern is set. Everybody preaches the same thing. If you go to a cell, I don't know if they've changed the model because, again, the model keeps changing, which is why it's very tricky. The last time I checked, in an average celebration church, they all preach the same thing on a given Sunday. The children churches all teach the same thing. So when you see their flyer, you have the topic of today. Then at the bottom, you have Lokogoma, Abuja, uh, sorry, Lokogoma, Otaku, uh, Ikeja. I don't know if there's one in Lekki or VI now. And you see all of those things there, London, everybody, they are doing the same thing. So that's an epi- Episcopal vibe. MFN, um, a lot of these churches are really Episcopalian. It's top down. You can shout at your pastor, shout at your pastor, start, start, shout at your pastor. If the zonal coordinator doesn't get permission from the higher coordinator, doesn't, nothing can be done. They come to tell the local church, your remittance is 15%. You have no say. You have no say. I was in a, an RCCG fellowship in school and it became a, an issue because they said, give us all your money. And we, the leader, said, so they, oh, sorry, people who watch this in online, they will come from my neck. But I cannot but say what I have experienced. Sometimes you hear things like, okay, as the offering is coming on Saturday, deposit it on Sunday. Oh, sorry, coming on Sunday, deposit it on Monday morning. Ensure that it's deposited. We want to be seen, when we see your statement, offerings deposited on Monday. And then from that offering, you send 30% to what we call remittance. And then you argue and say, how will we buy fuel for generator? You know what they tell you? If you need it, come and tell us. But we gave in the church to buy fuel in the generator. So a lot of our Nigerian churches, Episcopalian. Somebody said it's a set man style. For me, I think it's Episcopalian. General overseers are just basically popes. Can you remove them? You can't remove them. They are dead. In fact, when they are dying, the best that can happen is the church will be split into two or three or four splinters. You see the same, the case with, uh, of course, I don't know much about CAC politics, but Babalola and some of the early leaders of the CAC. What happens is they will split. Same thing happened with Idahosa when Idahosa died and his wife, what's her name now? No, Margaret, Margaret. When, when Benson died, Margaret took over. And then it's then you start seeing articles saying a woman should not be head of the church because it's an epi- Episcopal system. In an Episcopal system, you don't choose your next leader, really. In a pure ep- Episcopacy, they are chosen by people who are not you. Sometimes they can even anoint the next leader while they are alive. And so you have to submit to them. So it's Episcopalian. So that's the first style. You see, there are some pros, but look at the cons. At the end of the day, but let me say this. Do you know some people come into congregational churches with this mindset? And that doesn't help them function as members. 
You're coming from a church where, which is why I want to explain all of these things and show us the different models. You're coming from a church where nobody disturbs you. Sit down and start discussing. What are we discussing in this place? That's why some people, they never talk because they don't get the point. They don't get the point. What are we talking about? You just come to church on Sunday, you get fed, and you leave. So why are you asking me whether I view the budget? People don't view budgets. People don't view budgets. I'm t- see, I'll tell you, if I tell you what I don't see, people don't view budgets. So you may stress yourself. Do- A lot of people, they don't care. Some parts of the church will say, okay, yes, we want to see. People don't care. In fact, some people, any name you bring in front, they will vote yes. You just bring it yes. Bring it yes. Yes, because they don't see the point. So people are in congregational churches thinking that they are in an Episcopal church. But I will end by saying, don't forget, a sound structure is essential for the church. So next week, Sunday, we'll, we'll see if we can examine both the Presbyterian and the Baptist model of church polity. Let's pray. Our Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand these things. Ultimately, we are not studying just to just to know more, but we are studying because we, we care about the church and we desire to know how we can be good, proper church members. We want to know how we can serve, how we can participate in the governance of the church. So we pray that you continue to grant us understanding as we go through our studies on church polity. Be with us as we continue with the rest of our service and cause that we will know of your power and presence amongst us today. It is in Jesus' name we have prayed.